Good evening. I'm Graham Allison. It's a great honor to welcome uh, tonight to, to the forum the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Mohamed Al-Baradei. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a back and forth here because it's an interesting occasion, especially for the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and the Kennedy School of Government tonight, that uh, just 10 years ago, in 1995, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded jointly to Sir Joseph Ross, uh, Rotblat and the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs. Rothblatt, who died this year at the age of 96, was one of the founders of the Pugwash Conferences in the 1950s, in which actually Paul Doty here, the founding director of BCSIA, was a very active participant and a central figure in that organization's work over the ensuing half century to reduce the dangers from nuclear weapons. Because the 1995 Peace Prize was shared by both a person and an organization, as again it is this year with Mohamed al baradei and the agency which he heads, the International Atomic Energy Agency, there were two acceptance speeches in December 1995 in Oslo. Dr. Rothblatt accepted for himself, and accepting on behalf of the Pugwash organization was our own John Holdren. Since 1996, our colleague here at the Kennedy School, director of the Program on Science, Technology, and Public Policy at the Belfer Center, and the Heinz Professor of Environment. John's been a member of the Governing Council of Pugwash and the principal drafter of its communique since 1982 and chair of its executive committee. So I thought it was quite fitting, uh, given that we have 
uh, two people here who have been associated with Nobel Peace Prizes awarded in the area of nuclear weapons and security, to ask John to introduce the 200 and 2005 Nobel Peace Prize winner, the first time this award has been given for things nuclear since 1995. John Holden. Thank you very much, Graham. It's a tremendous uh, honor to have the opportunity tonight to introduce Dr. Mohamed el Baradei and to celebrate with all of you the splendid award of the 2005 Nobel Peace Prize to Dr. el Baradei and to the organization he heads, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Dr. el Baradei is the fourth director general in the history of the International Atomic Energy Agency. It was founded, created in 1957 as an outgrowth of the Atoms for Peace program, and in parallel uh, with that, as an expression of the world's ambivalence about the future of nuclear energy, wanting on the one hand to benefit from its potential to deliver energy to meet human needs, and wanting on the other hand to ensure that nuclear energy was not used for harm in the form of producing nuclear weapons. The International Atomic Energy Agency took on additional meaning and force with the signing and ratification of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 and its entry into force in 1970. The IAEA became the international entity charged with monitoring the world's nations in respect to the provisions of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Dr. Alberade was trained as a lawyer, got his first law degree at the University of Cairo, a doctorate in international law at New York University School of Law, 1974. He had a career in the Egyptian diplomatic service, uh, serving on two occasions in the permanent missions of Egypt uh, to the United Nations in New York and Geneva. He served as special assistant to the foreign minister, minister of Egypt. Uh, became a senior fellow in the International Law Program at the UN Institute for Training and Research, served as an adjunct professor of international law at the New York University School of Law. He was uh, a senior member of the IAEA Secretariat from 1984, and he was appointed Director General in 1997. He was just recently, in September of this year, uh, reappointed to a third term. I want to read you a couple of words from the uh, Nobel Peace Prize citation. The Nobel Committee has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2005 is to be shared in equal parts between the International Atomic Energy Agency and its Director General, Mohamed el Baradei, for their efforts to prevent nuclear energy from being used for military purposes and to ensure that nuclear energy for peaceful purposes is used in the safest possible way. It concludes after an intervening paragraph as follows. In his will, Alfred Nobel wrote that the Peace Prize should, among other criteria, be awarded to whomever had done most for the abolition or reduction of standing armies. In its application of this criterion in recent decades, the Norwegian Nobel Committee has concentrated on the struggle to diminish the significance of nuclear arms in international politics with a view to their abolition. That the world has achieved little in this respect makes active opposition to nuclear arms all the more important today. The paragraphs that I'm not going to read stress the importance of an international approach to the problem of nuclear proliferation and noted that Dr. Alberade has been the embodiment uh, of that approach. I will say just a few more words. Uh, I personally have been watching this area for 35 years. I think Dr. Alberade is without question the most effective, most competent, most ingenious, most creative, and most energetic of all of the directors general that the IAEA has had. He has been willing repeatedly to speak truth to power, which is not always a characteristic encountered uh, in the international political arena. He has pointed out repeatedly the responsibilities of the nuclear weapon states to meet their ob obligations under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to move toward eliminating their own nuclear arsenals as an important ingredient of a global strategy to restrain the spread 
of nuclear weapons. It is uh, an immense pleasure, uh, therefore, for me to be able to both congratulate Dr. Alberade on the receipt of the Nobel Peace Prize and to congratulate him as well on the exceptionally distinguished career which has earned it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, John. Uh, let me tell you how uh, we propose to do tonight uh, at uh, Mohammed's uh, uh, request. He said rather than uh, giving a speech, uh, since he's given a lot of speeches, he would propose that we have a conversation. And so we're going to start with a conversation that basically consists of some of the questions that I think would be most relevant for us as an audience. But he can, of course, take us off in any direction that he wants to go. And after we've had a conversation here on the stage for about 35 minutes or so, we're going to the audience for questions. So uh, I would only second what uh, uh, my colleague John Holden has said about uh, Mohammed al whose career I've watched over many, many years and whom I've admired uh, greatly and whom I've had an opportunity to uh, interact with uh, with uh, fantastic admiration. I'd say that we're lucky as citizens to have such a committed and effective international uh, public servant. And he's a great example for students here in the school and for the rest of us in terms of what we try to do. So let me, let me start us with the, the big picture, just Mohammed stepping back a, a, a step. In 1963, so go back a long time, uh, President John F. Kennedy made his famous prediction that, quote, by 1970, there are likely to be 10 nuclear powers instead of four. And by 1975, 15 or 20. Now, Kennedy uh, offered this as a warning, not, not as something to be just accepted, but as a warning to motivate actions that would cause this not to happen. But this was the trajectory, as he said. Uh, and that led to a series of actions, including the hotline, the limited test ban treaty, and a set of activities that ultimately became the nonproliferation treaty. So here we are 40 years on. Um, I'd be interested in your assessment of what factors you would identify as the most important in ultimately falsifying this prediction of where things would have gone in the absence of, of uh, actions. John and Graham, let me first say uh, thank you for your frightfully embarrassing introduction. And uh, <laughs> uh, 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 then let me, let me, Graham was telling me that he, he was behind the architecture of this building here, and this was supposed to be like the, an agora, you know, where people will be selling chicken and Socrates will be walking around, you know. Well, luckily tonight we'll not have people selling chicken or you will not have Socrates. But, yeah. but Hopefully, we'll have some just common sense discussion and conversation on, on some of the issues that we are really facing uh, and that are threatening our very survival, uh, meaning proliferation of, of weapons of mass destruction, most particularly uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, when we talk about nuclear weapons, when we talk about weapons of mass destruction, we're really talking about global security what kind of security system we would like to see prevailing. Why countries feel the need, the temptation, to develop nuclear weapons. I think that's, that's a fundamental question we need to understand, to address. We cannot just deal with the symptoms. You know, it, we cannot just say, you know, let, us, let us fix North Korea, let us fix Iran, you know, let us fix Iran. We need to understand you know, why countries feel that they have the need you know, to develop weapons of mass destruction. Primarily, they, are, they feel insecure. In certain cases, they feel they would like to project powers. But in whatever the reason, we need to understand the motivation and address both the symptoms and the causes. If I look to the global security system we have right now, uh, I think I will not be exaggerating to say that it is dysfunctional system. Uh, we established a system in 1954, the United Nations system, 
Security Council was supposed to be the embodiment of collective security, providing a system of security that inclusive, equitable, effective. Well, none of that happened. Uh, well, we, we hid behind the Cold War for a while, said the Cold War led to the paralysis of the Security Council. Then we were all full of euphoria, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, that now we are going to have the end of history, we're going to have, you know, a, a new system of security where people would not have to feel threatened. Well, unfortunately, we did not do very much, you know. If I look, again, to the, the threats we are facing today, well, the number one, clearly, is poverty, infectious disease, environmental degradation. I'll give you just one, one number, uh, you know, how much you are de doing, dealing with that. We spent in 2004 $1.3 trillion on armament. The official development assistance, the global official development assistance, is $80 billion the same year. Yeah. Less than 10%. You know. uh, I was talking recently to John Morris, who is the you know, uh, director of the World Food Program, who is responsible for feeding the hungry. He was telling me, and that was very telling, he said, if I get 1% of what we spend on armament, nobody, nobody in this world will, will go to sleep hungry. Well, there's a problem there, but move on. Second threat clearly is civil wars, you know, interstate wars. In the decade of 1994 to 2003, 12 million people lost their lives in civil wars, you know. We all still vividly remember, you know, clearly, and we should, you know, the 9-11, you know, the 3,000 some people who died. Would any of us would remember the 3.7 million people died in Congo for, in, in the span of five years, you know. Nine million people died in 10 years as a result of civil war in sub-Saharan Africa. And these are the people who are the most hungry, the most poor. You know, where we still have 1.2 billion people in the world live under one dollar a day. A day you know. So you have the poverty, you have the inequity, you have the, which result in the civil war. Then, then all the other symptoms will follow. Organized crimes, terrorism, and then of course, the capital, which is weapons of mass destruction. You know. If I look, to the area where I'm familiar with, where I deal with, you know, which is weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons. You know. uh, Graham, you were right. I mean, Kennedy was warning us that we should really do something about controlling you know, the spread of nuclear weapons because if we, if we move from 5 to 10 to 15, 20, that really is going to be the beginning of the end for us. Because the prospect of miscalculation, intentional, unintentional use of nuclear weapons will increase exponentially. We have managed well for a number of years. We, we got the NPT treaty, the non-proliferation treaty in 1970, and the whole idea there was that we should put a stop to the spread of nuclear weapons. By that time, we had five nuclear weapon states. Five was five too many, according to the NPT. Everybody else should commit themselves not to develop nuclear weapons, and the nuclear weapon states will commit themselves to move away toward nuclear disarmament. That was in 1970. Well, everybody joined the treaty today except three, India, Pakistan, and Israel, for a variety of geopolitical reasons. They felt that their security situation is not conducive for them to give up the nuclear option. So we ended up with eight countries you know, who are officially or unofficially nuclear, nuclear weapon states. Uh, and then, lately, North Korea decided to walk out of the treaty, you know, and again declared that they have nuclear weapons. Well, we have now nine nuclear weapon states. Well, maybe you say this is good news from a Kennedy perspective, uh, but if I, if I see the development in the last few years, I would say I will not go to sleep feeling very comfortable, because the last five years, the development in the last five years have been very worrying. What do we see? We see a number of additional countries trying to acquire nuclear weapons. We have seen Libya, as I've said. Korea have already decided to work, to work out. We're still going through 
verifying the Iran nuclear program. And as I keep saying, the jury is still out. What's more, more also worrying that we now see countries who are trying to apply a, a much more sophisticated approach, saying we don't really need nuclear weapons, but we need the capacity to build nuclear weapons in a very short span of time. How can we do that? Let us develop the, the capability to enrich uranium or reprocess plutonium. So I will sit on an enrichment factory. I'll sit in a reprocessing factory. That would give me the chance within a few months to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm still kosher. I'm still within the treaty bounds. You know, I'm still not doing anything illegal. But yet, I'm sending very powerful message to my neighbors that I know how to do it, should I decide to do it. And if I, my security perception will change, you know, I can do that in a matter of months. Uh, to me, you know, if we continue on that path, you know, uh, the security margin we have is almost fictional. You know, th that we will then have 10, 20, 30 countries, maybe not overt nuclear weapon states, but closeted, covert, virtual, whatever you want to call them. But uh, that, is, that is a situation which is obviously need to, to be reversed, absolutely. Uh, then I see another very frightful development, which is terrorism. What we saw here in 9-11 is, among other horrible things, the sophistication of some of the terrorists. You know. We know that they are interested in acquiring nuclear weapons. We know that they, if, if they acquire nuclear weapons, in, in all likelihood, they are going to use it because the so-called concept of nuclear deterrence you know, does not obtain, you know, is, not, is, not, is not relevant in their case. Uh, then I look at the behavior of the weapon states. And Joel Holdren mentioned that I sometimes talk about the behavior of the nuclear weapon states. But the weapon state to me are the one who should lead by example. You know, the weapon state to me are the one who should set the stage. Uh, and we haven't really seen much of that because according to NPT, they're supposed to be moving away from nuclear weapons. Are they really moving away from nuclear weapons? Uh, we still have 20, 27,000 warheads in existence, both active and inactive. 20,000. 7,000 warheads in existence. We still have a status of alert of half an hour. You know. I was talking last week to Sam Nunn, you know, and you know, he's one of the leading experts on defense matter, and he thinks this is absolutely crazy, that after 15 years of the end of the Cold War, the Russian and the American president will only have half an hour, you know, that time they will get a cup of coffee to respond to a potential nuclear attack. You know. uh, if that, if that's a kind of security margin we would like to live in. Uh, we do see continuing reliance on the so-called nuclear deterrence, you know, that ultimately, you know, at least there is like 30 countries, the NATO countries, the weapon states, and some, some of their allies, continue to rely on nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence. What message are you sending to those who are playing in the minor league? You know, that if you really want to protect yourself, you better join the major league. You better, you better join the big boys. You better try to emulate what the big boys are, are doing. What you, what you, we haven't seen any, any work you know, for an alternative system of security that does not depend on nuclear deterrence. We all talk about nuclear disarmament, but I yet have to see a credible alternative to nuclear deterrence. True, nuclear deterrence has been useful prevented the war for, you know, since, the, you know, since the Second Cold War. But we owe it to ourselves, I believe, both scientists, social thinkers, you know, uh, lawyers, everybody, to develop a system that can protect us, that does not depend on nuclear weapons. And that is not there yet. And to me, un until we do that, uh, until we do that, we, are con we will continue to speak rhetoric and not really real stuff. Is, you know, are there remedies? Of course there are remedies, you know. I can go through a litany of remedies, you know. Uh, one of the issues, of course, that the nuclear weapon state should create an environment which basically say nuclear weapons are a historical accident from which we need to extricate ourselves as early as we can, you know. Uh, that, but if you read sometime that there are still efforts to modernize nuclear weapons. There is still effort to 
develop new bunker busters, many nukes. Well, that is not, you are not really sending the message that you are looking at exit strategy, that you are, you are looking at, at, at consolidating what you have. And the message you are sending to the rest of the world, in my view, I see it every day, is, a, is an environment of cynicism, you know, that you are creating the two worlds, the haves and have-nots. To me, that is not sustainable because we know that technology is out of the tube. We have seen many countries who are able now to acquire you know, the, the know-how to develop nuclear weapons. And if, unless we create an environment which clearly sends a, a very powerful message that nuclear weapons are not here to stay, nuclear weapons is not our ultimate aim, we are all working together to control, the, freeze the number of nuclear weapon state and move away from it, unless we do that, I think we're doomed. Another issue, of course, is, or another remedy, if you like, is, is with regard to the fuel cycle. Is it really rational for every country to develop their own enrichment factory? Well, the answer is absolutely no. You know, these are sensitive technology that if countries want to use that technology for their own economic social development, they can. But let us multinationalize this operation. Let us regionalize this operation. So no one country alone can have their hands on enrich, highly enriched uranium or, reprocess, or, or plutonium, the, the, amount, the material they need to develop weapons. But it should be a multiple layer of control through a number of verification mechanisms, including international mechanism, multinational mechanism. Uh, this is the way to go. Uh, the good news here, I say, I should say, at least hopefully, there are some good news at the end of the day, that uh, this idea, which I have been talking about for two, three years now, is started to catch up. You know. People now are saying, let us develop a system of assurance of supply. So every country that needs reactor technology, that needs fuel, will be guaranteed that fuel on the basis of a reliable non-proliferation criteria. So it should not be because I don't like you, because you are a mullah, I don't like you because you are a Buddhist. It, if you comply with certain international norm, you will be given that access to technology. Uh, but not the, the enrichment, not the reprocess. Uh, in the last few months, I got the Russian to commit themselves that they are ready to work with us to develop a fuel bank for the agents to be able to guarantee supply as a, as a last resource supply. The U.S. have committed themselves to give us 17 metric tons of highly enriched uranium to be down blended, again to be used as, as part of that fuel bank. The NTI, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Sabnan and Tad Turner, said that they were ready to give us quite a large sum of money to help us again build that bank. That to me is, is, is a rational way of thinking. Let us first, because if we do an assurance supply, then the second logical step that we will take away the justification, the incentive from any country to say, I'd like to have my own enrichment facility. And if, if I give them what they need, then I can tell them, can we all agree to have a moratorium? And that would be my second step. A moratorium for, say, 10 years to not to have any new countries at developing either enrichment or reprocessing. Then the third phase will be, I look at the back end of the fuel cycle, and I don't want to get very technical, but the back end, the reprocessing and the waste management. And there again, Russia is willing to, to man an international center for the spent fuel for reprocessing, take away all the spent fuel and reprocessing. Fourth and final phase would be ideal with the guys who have already the enrichment facilities right now. These are like 12 countries, you know, the, the US of the days, the Japanese, the Indian. And there again, hopefully, we'll get them to multinationalize these, these existing facilities. Because unless you have a system that looks equitable, that looks fair, we will not be able to have it. So there is a solution there. Uh, then I look at physical protection of nuclear material. You know, again, we have made good, good progress in making sure that material is, is as far away from the hand of terrorists as possible. Have we done the job fully? Not yet. I mean, again, it's a question of money in many ways. Sam Nunn and others and Luger, Dick Luger and others have done tremendous job, you know, synthesizing, energizing, you know, you know, and, and of the need to physical protection. But we are in 
in a race against time, frankly. You know, we are not, we are not there. You have done a lot of work, Graham, on that, so you are much better, you know, expert on the area of nuclear terrorism, physical protection. But that's an area, again, we, we, we have still a lot of work on our hands. Then I look at the Security Council, for example. Security Council has not been, and Karen has, is here and he's familiar with it. You know, he's, uh, in, in certain cases it worked, in, in many other cases it didn't work. You know, in, in, 2000, in 1993, you know, we referred North Korea to the Security Council. And that was the last time we heard from the Security Council. You know. uh, in, by, by 2005, North Korea said that they developed nuclear weapons. You know. But that's not, that's not the kind of security system you would like. You'd like a security council that is always fully engaged that at all times, that is able to take action you know, concretely in case, for example, if a country were to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty, what they are really saying, well, we're withdrawing from the treaty because we'd like to exercise our option to develop nuclear weapons. And if that's not a threat to international peace and security, I don't know what is. You know. Uh, and yet, in the case of, the, of North Korea, we, it was you know, damning silence what we got from the Security Council. But you can argue of the geopolitics, you can argue why the Security Council did not act. The net result, that can, a country was able to move away from the entire system with impunity. Uh, I should end by saying what, uh, the way North Korea was able to do that because the environment is still a very cynical environment because the weapon state cannot really say we are going to put you on the dog's house because you are developing nuclear weapons at a time when they already themselves are still at work accelerating you know, the development of their own nuclear weapons. Uh, this is the fundamental issue we need to address, how we can at, at, at a certain stage develop a, a security system where everybody feels secure where everybody feels they don't need to develop nuclear weapons. They can fight like hell, but get the military part out of the equation. I mean, I always say, I'd like to see the world like the European Union, like the OECE. You know, the European Union are not you know, are the, the greatest lover at all time. They fight about 100 different things, but they never think of, you know, of using arms, you know, because they've decided that the armament is, is outside the equation. Can we create a world when the 25 European states is transposed to have the 192? Well, this is a dream. This is, I'm not going to, to be around to see that, but this is the way we should continue to work. Well, you, Mohammed, you are wonderful. I mean, you're, we're often 100, 100 different interesting domains here. Let me try to just more we'll briefly drill down on a couple, and then we'll come to the audience discussions. You mentioned... Uh, the work that you've done, which is, I think, one of the most creative ideas in the whole uh, domain of uh, this topic, the proposal to have this moratorium on any new enrichment or reprocessing. This is something you proposed back several years ago, and now it is getting legs. And actually, when we were in Moscow recently, uh, Bodman has proposed sure. to provide some fuel. Rumansiev, the Russian equivalent, has proposed to at least match it. NDI is helping you work out the arrangements. So let's take it now concretely to Iran. And you and I were chatting about this earlier. No, I think there's nobody in the world who spent more time trying to talk to Iranians about nuclear issues than you. And for simple Americans, we find this pretty puzzling, what this regime, uh, people that seem very friendly towards the US, a mulocracy that seems pretty odd, elections which bring to power somebody who says last week, we need to wipe Israel off the map, which reminded me that the person who was his opponent in this, who was regarded as the moderate, mm -hmm. I was remembering uh, the quote from Raf Tanjani, in which he had said in 2001, quote, the use of a single atomic bomb has the power to destroy Israel completely. So what are we to make of this, you know, as you're trying to get them into the box in which they don't do their own enrichment and reprocessing and have their own nuclear weapons? Well, Iran is a very complex situation, Graham. And when you look at the nuclear issue, this is, as I always say, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is a very complex 
relationship between Iran and the West since 1979, I think, the hostage taking. You know, it is marred by economic sanctions. It is marred by total lack of distrust on both sides. It is marred by you know, grievances about respect for human rights, about supporting extremist groups. Uh, it, is, it is marred by grievances on the part of the Iranian that they could not even get spare part for their ailing Boeing fleet. So it is not just the nuclear is the tip of the iceberg. And to me, to be able to resolve the Iranian issue, as I always say, is all the concerned parties need to sit around the table the way you are exactly doing in the case of North Korea. Put all your grievances on the table. Uh, address them in a, in, a, in, a, in a very open and, and, and constructive way and try to provide a package solution that would recognize Iran as a regional power, you know, delimit what exactly is permissible in a regional setting, uh, try to provide incentives and disincentives, and, and move on. You know, uh, I think you know, we can continue to go through a process of escalation, retaliation, but at the end of the day, the problem will not be resolved unless and until the parties, all the parties, will come back and sit at the negotiating table. I deal with part of Iran to make sure that their program is exclusively for peaceful purpose. We made the, we're making good progress there. Even today, we have gotten access to a military facility, which is a good thing. You know, so despite some of the unfortunate, very unfortunate rhetoric that has come recently, they're still cooperating with the agency on trying to resolve some of the outstanding issues. But the bigger picture is that the engagement between Iran and the European Union that has been going through a hiccup in the last few few months. You know, it has been it came to a halt because Iran decided to to start unilaterally operation of some some nuclear activities. Well, that that's where we need to get them back to the negotiating table. And again, the good news that there's many countries who are very actively engaged right now. Primarily the Russian. The Russian are very actively engaged in trying to provide a formula that provide a face saving for both parties and get them back to the negotiating table. But no, Mohammed, mm. just on the on this particular rhetor rhetoric, yeah. it's it's unusual. There's not a lot of people in the world that go around and saying yeah. we need to wipe Correct. this country off Correct. the map or this Correct. one off the map. How, how how do you interpret what that what those noises I mean this is this they they think this is a serious idea or this I, is just a a noise or they have a plan or they have a hope uh, I, again, <laughs> I don't want to read there. I, I hope it is just a noise. It shouldn't be more than a noise. I think it's very unfortunate that this took place at a time when we're trying to build bridges between Iran and the rest of the world. Well, this is clearly uh, has been condemned, frankly, by every leader yeah. of the world, including Kofi Annan and every, and obviously that's not the kind of language we would like to hear. Uh, but uh, I don't think, I don't think that is, this is simply, again, part of this propaganda by to, to try to create the environment that you are in a better position to negotiate. So, so you just regard it as huffing and puffing. Yeah? It is huffing and puffing, I think, I, I hope, you know, and, uh, but it is huffing and puffing that should not take place. You know, that is not, there is, a, there is a red line, you know, of what sort of huffing and puffing one should engage in. You know? okay. Let me take you back to the point that John Holden introduced on uh, speaking truth to power, because this is one of the interesting questions we discuss here at uh, at Harvard uh, often. Uh, we had Hans Blix, uh, your predecessor at the IAEA here last week, and he was, uh, we were walking around this issue. I mean, if I were putting this in a controversial way, I would say, you deal with many difficult governments. Is the Iranian, are the Iranians more difficult than some other governments closer to home, but I, that would be undiplomatic. So let me, let me state it slightly differently. I would say... Where is home for me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe a country or whose capital is closest to you now. But the, uh, one of the points that uh, Blix was uh, raising was there's these famous or notorious or infamous 16 words in President Bush's 2003 State of the Union, which is now part of the CIA leak uh, debate in Washington, uh, in which he said, quote, the British government has learned that Saddam Hussein's, Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium 
from Africa, and this was the so-called Niger deal. Now, Blick said that when the information on the basis of which that claim was made was finally handed over to the IAEA after you had been trying to offer people a view about it for some number of months, so it was finally handed over in February of 2003, it took the IAEA only one day to demonstrate that this was a falsification. First, is that correct? And second, what does this tell us about speaking truth to power? Well, maybe it didn't take us one day, but maybe three. But uh, <laughs> it, was not, it was not very sophisticated forgery. I mean, we, I mean, our people you know, who are not the best forensic expert in the world uh, came to the conclusion right away that this is not, this is not really serious. You know, it, 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 it was forgery. And, and, and we did say so. I mean, I, I mean, our role was basically to go through all the intelligence we get at that time when we continue to get. It's very difficult, you know, to, to try to separate information from misinformation, you see. Our role is to be credible. We have no hidden agenda. We have to provide all the facts as we see them. Uh, we do not take the decision at the end of the day, Graham. The member state, the, the, you know, take the decision. But we are, you know, our strength is, is being credible. And we cannot be credible unless we are darn careful about separating disinformation from info. We still get a lot of disinformation, we, we, but we still get good credible information. And in the case of Iraq, that's what we were, we were doing. I mean, we, we were saying that, you know, we didn't really see any evidence that Iraq reconstituted its web, nuclear weapon program. We did say that we wanted some few mo more months. I, I remember, I think it was in January, when I said this would have been an investment in peace if we got, I think I was calling for three months. And, uh, well, we didn't get that. Uh, we, we were proven right. I mean, but again, I, I, I'm relieved that we were proven right, that, uh, that Saddam Hussein, who was a horrible dictator, did not have nuclear weapons. I could have been wrong. But, but what's important, that, that we really should take our... We learn a lot of things of Iraq, uh, in, of Iraq, of course, that basically we need to take our time before we make you know, major decisions that has to do with war and peace. We need to check our facts. We need to be thorough about our facts. And, and we, we, we need to try to exhaust every possible political remedy before we, we resort to force. Uh, to me, I, I think I, you know, force is... I would only think of force when it is the best option available after exhausting all other options. You know. uh, that doesn't mean you know, that sometimes people accuse me I'm a pacifist. Well, I'm not. Uh, I hope I'm not. But, uh, because, no, but what I, 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 I see that we need to first to understand that if you really want durable peace, you know, even if you go to war, you still have to come back to the negotiating table. You know, unless you get people together to feel that they are getting a fair deal, it will, not, it will not last. We've seen it from the First World War, Second World War. So, Sure, you have to have pressure. You have to have the threat of force. But the less you use that, and the more you use soft power, I think, as Jonah will, will, will say, I think uh, the more, the more you, are, you are in the... Here's Jonah, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, all right. The more... The more well, I'm a strong believer in soft power because I think they are effective, you know, and uh, I'm not saying that I will shy away at all time from the use of force, but, but I'm saying let me exhaust every other, every possibility. Let us, let us be patient, you know. I mean, again, a lot of people are, feel very impatient about the Iranian situation, but my answer always is as long as we're making progress, as long as I don't see clear and present danger, you know, let us continue at it. Let us try to get to the bottom of it because uh, uh, before we think of other, of other escalate, esca enforcement measure, you know, force or otherwise. Well, I, I remember many instances in which you have uh, dealt very diplomatically and uh, oftentimes uh, patiently and uh, sometimes effectively with an American government which has not always been your g best friend. Uh, now, I don't know... Uh, in terms of truth to power, what, what, what was the most difficult of these cases in which you found yourself dealing with uh, 
some of your most difficult interlocutors? Uh, well, I think quite a few, but I, you know, and, uh, but I think the good news again, Graham, that we have reached an understanding that we can agree to disagree, you know, and uh, it, it is, it, we have to understand that we, if we disagree, we disagree uh, on the basis of honest difference in perceptions, you know, and I mean, I was really touched, I should tell you, you know, three days ago when Colin Powell called me from Los Angeles to congratulate me and, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we said that we had gone through a difficult time together, but we will continue, continue to remain the best of friends, you know, and, and that's, that's the way I'd like to deal with, with all the government I deal with. And I have now very good working relationship with Secretary Rice, with, you know, Steve Hadley and others, and uh, I think people need to understand, you know, where we are as an international civil servants. As I said, we do not have any agenda of our own, you know, but we, we can succeed if you allow us government to succeed. If we get the mandate, if we got the resources, if we, if we, if we get the unified support. But I also owe it to you to give you the, the way I see things. I owe it to you to give you the options of available to you. Uh, whether you take the right decision or the wrong decision, that's your decision. But I will continue, as you said, to speak truth to power because I'm hired to do that. You know. Well, uh, just for the audience, this would be an inappropriate question to ask you, but I will observe, uh, as a pretty careful observer of this space, that uh, Mohammed al Baradei, having performed uh, well, in my view, extremely well, for his first two terms, as director of IAEA, was strongly opposed by one government, uh, very strongly opposed by one government, and only one government, which happened to be the U.S. government. Uh, it was, the U.S. government was not able to find anybody to run against him. Okay? Uh, well, nobody so, wants to have my uh, job. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, and if we listen to the challenges, you can understand. It's not uh, the most coveted job, under, I can tell understand you. Understand why, but having, having discovered that there was no alternative to Secretary Rice's great credit, she's expressed some considerable enthusiasm for you in your, I, in your third term. Yeah. Absolutely. I can tell you that, uh, that if, if you ask my daughter, she think I'm crazy that I'm still, still managing, oh, yeah. running for a third term. But, but anyway, no, I, I think it is a difficult job. But, but again, I, I keep always telling everybody, I cannot do I cannot succeed alone. I need, I need governments to help me. And, and in that way, I'm no different from any other multilateral institution. But I need also civil society. You know, I think I was mentioning yesterday to a lunch you know, with the Norwegian foreign minister who is again trying to organize a follow up to the dismal failure of the summit last month on even mentioning arms control and disarmament. You read this outcome of the, of the summit, you know, 35 pages. There's not the word disarmament or arms control. To me, this is a world in denial, you know, that, you know, they think by not talking about it, it doesn't exist. Well, that, that tells me that you need to engage civil society. And, and frankly, you know, the best I see from this Nobel, you know, prize is a recognition, you know, that we have a problem on our hand, a recognition that we need to deal with that problem, a recognition that only through multilateral approaches, you know, so <laughs> slow as it may be, you know, uh, enervating as it may be, it's the only game in town because I don't see any of our problem, whether you talk about environment, arms control, poverty, AIDS, that no one country, powerful or weak, can, can resolve it alone. We need to. Uh, you know, resign ourselves to understand that we need to work as one part of one human family. Uh, either we are all going to succeed together or we are going to be, you know, in the, in, in, in the we fail together. Yes, Let me uh, suggest that we go to the audience here. I'm going to ask one question as we uh, get to the microphones. There are microphones on the ground floor and in the first loges, and I don't know, or any more, and, the, and on the third floor. So. Uh, Mohammed, just for one sure. uh, a 30 second question and a 30 second answer. Sure. On nuclear terrorism, one of our local subjects here, uh, Kofi Annan said, uh, in conjunction with the recent uh, uh, Security Council session, he said, quote, 
Nuclear terrorism is still often treated as science fiction. I wish it were. Were such an attack to occur, it would not only cause widespread death and destruction, but would stagger the world economy and thrust tens of millions of people into dire poverty. If you're assessing risks of a nuclear bomb, just one bomb going off in one city, you would say, small, medium, large, how would you give us a short sense of your assessment of that danger today? It is a serious danger. There's no, I mean, I, I can't really say it's probable, it's you know, possible, but it is a serious danger. I mean, I've seen in the last 10 years 200 cases of illicit trafficking of nuclear material. So there is a, a demand, there is you know, a supply. Luckily, none of these were large amount that could go into a nuclear weapon, but 200 cases in 10 years of nuclear material being smuggled across border is enough to make us absolutely worry about our very survival. Gentlemen, please introduce yourself, and questions are uh, short and to the point. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Felix Maradiaga. I'm from Nicaragua, an MPA student here at the Kennedy School. First, uh, let me congratulate you on your well-deserved uh, prize. I had the opportunity some years ago to do a very brief internship in your agency as part of the UN disarmament program. I have two brief questions. The first, do you see any role for small developing countries in nuclear disarmament? Because I grew very frustrated as a member of a tiny country such as Nicaragua in this effort of nuclear disarmament. And my second question, what would you say to those who argue, or argue in the past that your agency has not done enough on uh, regards to the uh, Iranian um, uh, nuclear program? I see a role for every individual in the, for, you know, for the cause of nuclear disarmament. I mean, as I, as I mentioned, I mean, there are lots of, I mean, disarmament starts with ideas, you know, and we need ideas. We need ideas for alternative system of collective security, as I mentioned. We need ideas too, as how to make sure, for example, that we have a moratorium on testing, indefinite moratorium, for example. I mean, we do not have a CTBT. Can't we have a moratorium again? You know, much easier, you know. We need ideas how to start you know, a treaty negotiation on to stop production of precise material. So there's lots. And in fact, the most champions of this army are the small countries, the Norways of the world, the, 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 you know, the, the, the Irish of the world. They are the one who really are the champion of this army. So I, I, see, I see a responsibility for every citizen. What, what was really amazing that Civil society never really got engaged in security issues. You know, they got engaged in trade, environment, but they always thought that security, you know, is something too sophisticated well, to be left to government. But with the dismal performance of government a month ago, as I said, you know, we 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 believe, I believe, that we really need the civil society to step up to the plate and 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 tell them, well, our survival is too important to be left alone to you, and we have a, we have a view to express. On, on the issue of, of Iran, I think, again, if you see what we have done in the last two and a half years in, in the Iranian program, uh, it's quite amazing you know, how much now we understand the nature, extent of the Iranian program. We're still at it. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult. I wish that we will bring that issue to a closure in the next few months. I, I'm calling on Iran every day to be as transparent, as, as open as possible, because we cannot continue through that process forever. Uh, but we are making progress, as, as, I, as I said, I haven't seen you know, a, a, a clear and present danger that would tell me I need to stop that process tomorrow and, and think of other alternatives. So, uh, but at the same time, I know that the international community is getting very impatient with, with the Iranian uh, conduct in, in, in providing the kind of assurance, the kind of, of, of transparency that we need to bring that issue to a closure and bring and tell the international community the Iranian program is, in fact, a peaceful program. I, I keep saying, until I get resolution of all the remaining issues, I, I, I keep saying the jury is still out. I'm not yet in a position to make such a statement. Okay, thank you. We're up here to the first lodge. And just one question per customer, please. Yeah, my name is Valerian. I'm a journalist by profession and a mid-career student. Now, my question is, if one listens to world leaders talking about weapons of mass destruction, and the fear that terrorists might lay their hands on weapons of mass destruction. The lead man has the idea that, oh, the weapons of mass destruction, they are something that can be assembled in a briefcase and then easily lifted and used by terrorists. Now, my question is, how real is this threat 
We know the process it takes to make weapons of mass destruction. How feasible is this threat of terrorists getting these weapons and using them? And on a scale of zero to 10, at what point would you calibrate this possibility of terrorists getting weapons of mass destruction and using them? What form would such an attack take from, say, North Korea, passing through London, maybe to Washington? Thank you. Maybe when I retire, I'll do some fiction stories. <laughs> but, but I can't really speculate on a scale of 1 to 10. All I can tell you, it is a serious threat. Uh, some threats are more probable than others. The possibility of terrorists acquiring, for, for example, a radioactive source and use you know, conventional explosion to disseminate radioactivity. That's not a nuclear explosion, but it still will create absolute terror if you detonate a powerful radioactive source in an urban center. That will create a lot of economic upheaval, a lot of you know, fatalities, and will create exactly what the, what the terrorists would want to be. This is very real because we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of radioactive sources around the world. We never thought that this you know, could be used for, for terrorist purpose. Uh, we, we're only looking at the safety of it, you know, the unintentional misuse of it. This is one of the areas, for, I will tell you that this is, this is again, an area when, when I see <coughs> probability that terrorists can, can get their hand on radioactive source. If I talk to a nuclear weapon, well, that's much more complicated. However, I would hope that they will not steal, for example, a ready-made nuclear weapon, you know, and that's why the physical protection is very important. Uh, can they have the material and assemble it? That's much more difficult. That's much more difficult. That's why I say it is there because I saw the sophistication of the terrorist. But, but it is not highly probable uh, uh, that they can get the material and develop. They can steal nuclear weapon, small nuclear weapon. Yes, they can if, if there is not adequate physical protection. They can have radioactive source. Yes, that easily they can do. Uh, so there are a, a variety of scenarios, but we need we need not to sit on our hands. We need to make sure, as I said, that we, we, we cover all fronts. We, 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 t we, we make sure that no one terrorist group or extremist group, whatever you want to call them, will ever get their hand on any of these, of these sources. But let's cross, cross our fingers and hope for the best. We're here to this lodge, please. Um, <coughs> you brought up the, uh, the question of the CIA. Sorry, leak. please introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Matthew Ogden. The, um, I've been working with uh, Lyndon LaRouche and EIR to expose the, the uh, case of the fraud around the forged documents of the Niger yellow cake around the, the office around Cheney and the recent indictment with Louis Libby. You brought up the CIA elite case and you also brought up the question of how the IAEA was investigating the, um, the, the forgeries coming around the Niger documents. I, um, I think now, now that the, the Louis Libby investigation or the indictments happened, what I've heard is that Patrick Fitzgerald is now extending his investigation into looking at the source of the, of the um, forged documents that the Valerie Plame case was a uh, cover-up to, to, um, to try to cover this question up. So let's and get the question. My question, my question is, um, I said I'm working with Lyndon LaRouche in the EIR magazine. We're doing an expose on the Italian, um, the, the Italian source of these fraud, fraudulent documents and the question of a ro the role of Michael Ledeen in the Italian intelligence services. I just wanted to know, I wanted you to comment a little bit more on that. And I wanted to know, I wanted to know what you thought about the fact that this guy Michael Ledeen has had a, a very dirty role in a number of things in the Iran Contra case, in the strategy of tension bombings in the 1970s and 80s, and that somebody like Ledeen, who wrote a book about universal fascism, could be involved in the source of these uh, fraudulent documents around the Niger Yellow. We got the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think we spent five minutes investigating Mr. Nadine because all we, we were concerned about is whether this document was really a credible document, a, a, an authentic document. And once we established it, is, it was a forgery, that was the end of the story for us. You know? So uh, it is really for CIA, for the MI6, you know, for the other intelligence agencies to go after and see who rose them, who, you know, who, who created that forgery. But unfortunately, unfor or unfortunately, we were, not, we were not involved in that. But I, and I think the, the point that you made before was that it having been referred to you, 
your, your task was to judge whether this is an authentic sure. or to forge document, sure. and you came to that conclusion pretty quickly. Very quickly. Unfortunately, the U.S. government didn't, but you didn't say that. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Mohamed Dashan. I'm a MPID student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, first, allow me to congratulate you once again for a very well-deserved prize, which was extremely great news for me and for 74 million people back home. Uh, my question is concerned the countries which are nuclear powers, which are non-signatories of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and which are basically subject to virtually no supervision from anyone, and who might very well be considered as the real nuclear threats. Now, what is the International Atomic Energy Agency doing uh, concerning those countries, and more particularly concerning the, well, the now quasi-dead project of a nuclear-free Middle East? Well, un unfortunately, we don't have you know, any jurisdiction, you know, to, to go and supervise the program in India or Pakistan or Israel. I mean, people always, particularly in, you know, in the Middle East, saying, well, you're doing a lousy job. You know, why aren't you going and inspecting the Israeli program? And I said, my authority to inspect the Israeli program is as good as yours, you know, because I, you know, I, I work on the basis of legal mandate, I, you know, and I don't, I, I'm only asked to supervise, investigate, uh, verify those who have joined the NPT, which is 186 non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, for Israel, India, and Pakistan, my situation is simply exactly like the five nuclear weapon states. You know, the US, Russia, France, China, and, and the UK. They are out of bound for the agency. That's, that's ex-official. As a person who would like to speak his mind sometimes, you know, I keep saying that uh, that, that situation is not sustainable. You know, as that you need guys to you know, fulfill your obligation under the NPT. Those who are outside of the NPT, they need to start working on moving toward, you know, toward ridding themselves of, of nuclear weapons. I have a mandate to, you know, from our member state to consult with, with the Israeli government, you know, to talk to them about, about a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. Last year, I went and met Prime Minister Sharon, and I said, Again, I, I don't think the situation in the Middle East is sustainable. In the long run, in the context of peace, there, ought, there must be a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, a weapon, in fact, free from all weapon of mass destruction. You need to have a security system in the Middle East that is parallel to the peace process. In fact, I've been saying that for a couple of years now, that you cannot have peace in the Middle East after 100 years of people killing each, each other with distrust and everything you, you can think of without having a parallel security system that undergird the peace process, which based on eliminating weapon of mass destruction, limiting conventional armament, confidence building measure. But there I speak simply as a modest public figure. Uh, uh, hopefully somebody would listen to me and, and, and act on it. Uh, so the short answer, I can only wield my stick when I have a mandate and have a bystander when I don't have a mandate. Well, I think actually it's a good reminder, especially for Americans who like to blame international agencies like the IAEA or the UN from time to time for failing to do something which the US and others don't give them a mandate to do. And in the case of the IAEA, which is usually criticized for having no teeth, so it can only, uh, as, a, as a, like a watchdog, bark that something bad is going on and refer it to the Security Council. If the Security Council, which consists of the nations, don't act, there's no action. That's the way the game was set up. And you can use your bully pulpit, and you That's do very correct. effectively, but you're not given an army or a, a police force That's or a... Well, Graham, if I, don't, if I don't have the legal mandate to go places, you know, if I don't have the financial resources, I, I can tell you, I mean, we have our verification budget is $120 million. That's a, that, on that show string budget, I'm supposed to verify the entire nuclear program in 186 countries. This is less than the budget of the Red Sox, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, 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 don't go to the Red Sox, that's okay. Yes, please. Maybe the Celtics, you know. That's okay. Celtics, that's okay. <laughs> please, introduce yourself. My name is Gulshan Saini, and I, my question is about Iran. Iran has been in the news recently about their nuclear development. Now, 
according to the investigation of IAEA, do you have any idea or can you tell us if Pakistan had any role in spreading that nuclear technology to Iran? That's the short list. Well, we know that Mr. A.Q. Khan, who is a Pakistani national, you know, uh, has been providing lots of knowledge, lots of information, uh, lots of hardware to, to Iran. That, I think that's an established fact. And uh, that was part of the network of illicit traffic of nuclear material, which, which has been amazing to see that it expanded all over the globe. There was more than 30 companies in 30 countries. Every part of the world were somehow engaged in this very sophisticated illicit trafficking of how to build nuclear weapons, you know, for years, you know. So, sure, I mean, the Mr. Aq Khan was in, engaged, you know. Where, was there anybody else engaged in Pakistan? Well, that's a different question, but, <coughs> but at least we know for sure that, that Mr. Aq Khan was involved. I should say, however, that the Pakistani government has been quite cooperati cooperating with, with us lately in, in trying to resolve some of the difficult issues surrounding the Iranian program. We're up here in the lodge. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Puyan Salahi. Um, I'm a first year student at the Harvard Business School and actually from Iran. Um, my question to you is with the election of the new president, have you experienced any, um, any major differences in negotiations with the regime? And also, what do you see as the major challenges in the negotiations in the near future? Well, the, the new regime just came to power very recently. I, I had one meeting with the new national security advisor, Mr. Larijani, and I, I should say I was quite pleased with the outcome of the meeting. He committed himself that he will continue to work with us, that they are now a united front in, in, in the people in power. They are all of the same thinking, and they are, would like to resolve the all issues surrounding their, uh, their nuclear program. As I said, in the last couple of weeks, we have seen some progress in some of these issues. So uh, I, I have no particular reason to complain at that stage of, of, of the degree of cooperation we are getting. I would like, however, to make, as I said, to accelerate the pace of resolving the outstanding issues. Because unless we resolve, we clear the past, we will not be able to regulate the future. And I keep telling the Iranian colleagues, you know, unless if there continue to be a question mark about your past program, the European and the US and other will have great difficulty trying to regulate the future. You need to build trust. There is a confidence deficit, as I, I say. There is a confidence deficit created as a result of the clandestine Iranian program. And to, you need to work to build confidence again. And, and confidence, you can lose confidence very quickly, but it takes time to build the confidence. And that's, that's where we are at, at, at this stage with Iran. Please. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Black, um, Harvard graduate and a physician, and I'm a veteran of several wars, on, usually on the front line, or picking up the mess afterwards. Um, my question is, how many women work in the International Atomic Energy Agency, and at what levels? And the reason I ask is that when you look at the figures of the 9 million excess deaths in Africa that you referred to, the majority were women and children. As we get better at protecting combatants, the death rate's going down amongst them, but it's going up in women and children. Yet there are very few women at senior negotiating levels at all. They're barely visible on the Security Council or on arms inspection missions. And if there's any group discussion on the topic, the woman who is speaking will most likely be from an NGO. And yet who's going to push the button? If we're going to bet, it's going to be a man. In fact, I don't even see one other woman lined up to ask a question tonight. So there's a striking lack of women's voices at senior level in this debate. I'm really intrigued to know why, and I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with you that we're still far away from gender equality, but not only in international institutions, but also at national governments. You know, uh, uh, women, <coughs> professional women in, in the IA are 20% of our core staff. Well, I'm trying my very best to increase that, but with great difficulty, I should tell you, because women in science, you know, in you know, physics, in radiochemistry are very few, you know, so we don't get, uh, you know, women applicants to be able to increase the number. I have, I can tell you at least one of my six deputies is a woman right now, and I'm very proud. This is the first woman we have appointed in the history of the agency to be at the deputy director level, and 
if you know any, of any qualified women who can, <laughs> <laughs> please, please let me know, because that, that is a, that's an issue. I fully agree with you. I'd like, to, I'd like to get more women on board. I feel much more comfortable working with women than with men. I can tell you that. that and, uh, but, but the problem is that we don't, we don't really have enough women who are making the shortlist for, for our stuff. And this is a problem. If you look at Russia, I mean, I, I go to Russia. I see, I, I'd like to see one Russian scientist working in the nuclear field, for example. <laughs> I go to Los Alamos. I, I see how many women you know, working in Los, at Los Alamos. So it really is, an, is, is a question of national education policies. And that we need to go at the roots again, start to change national education policies, encourage women to go into science and natural science. And, and, and then we'll be able to establish what I think is overdue gender equality. It should take about 20 years then. Sorry? That would take about 20 years. Is there something we can do before then? Well, I, I have an affirmative action plan, if you like, which basically saying any woman who makes a short list, I, I pick the woman. But I, you know, I, I, I cannot invent women if, if, they are not, <laughs> if they are not qualified. So actually, maybe this is a good challenge for this local community to try to see if we I, have some I, candidates. Absolutely. And I think Mohammed has at least expressed an interest if we're able to develop some. So please, thank you. Thanks. This gentleman. Hi, my name is Miles Robinson. I'm also a student of Lyndon LaRouche. And he is no stranger of, a, of nuclear disarmament policy. He was actually the author of what uh, Ronald Reagan later coined the uh, SDI Act. And right now he's calling for, uh, for also a bunch of other measures too in order to aid us along. And I know you're in the, uh, in the world capital of free trade, and, and no pun intended. I was wondering if you could... Um, comment on the role a new world monetary system actually reformed in the method of Franklin Roosevelt's Bretton Woods would play in the scientific advancements necessary to get us to a, a society which is run by cold fusion technology. What about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do, do, do you see some hope or prospect of a cold fusion world at some point looking, you know, next generation or... And, and specifically the role of a new monetary system in that. The role of the monetary system? The monetary yeah, a system. Yeah, a new Bretton Woods. But the, <laughs> I think that, that the, the director general probably doesn't do monetary systems, well, I'm but just curious to see. I'm, I'm out of my depths when it comes to monitoring, <laughs> monitoring system. However, I listen to, you know, to, to the people who are, you know, managing director of the IMF, you know, the World Bank, and... It's very complicated. I mean, you're really talking about poverty. And I mean, we, last week we had a lot of talks about poverty. And I, I believe, I think, listening to them, it's not just a question of money, although money is a major you know, uh, you know, issue there. But it's a question of building institutions. It's a question of education. It's a question of good governance. So we need to work simultaneously on, on many issues at the same time. But, but clearly, you know, to know that there is 1.2 billion people live under one dollar a day. I read, I read recently a very interesting figure, you know, that as I said, the, the, the official development assistance, all the, you know, our good heart, you know, charity to, to, to the developing world is around 80 million dollars. In the US last year, we spent 35 billion dollars on, on, on pet products, you know. Well, you know, half, half of the entire development assistance to the entire world, you know. But there's something wrong with our Priorities. I mean, as I said, I mean, I had a dog, and and I, had, and I love my dog, but but I'd like to but, but I'd like to to see that we spend more money on our fellow human beings. Yeah. Okay. Wait, excuse me. Now we're going to do one question at a time and one per customer. And this gentleman gets the last question. Thank you, uh, Doctor Barad. Uh, my name is Mohammed Lassas. I'm an MPID student here at the Kennedy uh, School. I'm from Jordan. Uh, Doctor Barad, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll I'll be very frank with you. You're no foreigner to the region, uh, to the Middle East. I was completely not satisfied with your answer regarding what can we do for Israel. I mean, there is, Iran takes all the, the talk, rightly so, in this, in this session, but it's pure game theory. As long as Israel continues to sit uninspected on piles of weapons, all countries around will seek, whether formally or informally, to militarize themselves. So you're not just one person, as you said. You're Nobel laureate, you're in your third term, and I hope you have it somewhere in your plan to make it part of your legacy, to make that contribution to the Middle East. I'll be frank with you. I'm, I'm really, I'll be very disappointed if you told me you can't do 
anything about it. I mean, I, I really pray to God you do have some sort of legacy hope for your region when it comes to Israel. Thank you. Good question. A hard question. What do, you, what do you think I can do more than I speak publicly as often as I can on the need for Israel to join a nuclear weapon free zone? I, that I do all the times in private, in public, with the Prime Minister of Israel, in, in public fora, in interviews. Uh, I would love to have my legacy establishing a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, but I will be f I'll not be honest with you if I say that I can do it because I need the governments to work with me. And what do you say to the Iranians when they say that? Sorry to cut you, but really, what do you say to the Iranians? If I am a student here, I'm not satisfied with this. What well, do you say to the Iranians when they argue? Well, the Iranians, again, this is, you have to separate between legal ob obligation and you know, the political system within which we operate. Iran is committed under the non-proliferation treaty to have nuclear weapons. So they are committed to request to accept our verification. I have a job to do. You know. Uh, you know, the person have said, make sure that I don't have nuclear weapon, verify that I don't have nuclear weapon. That's what I do. Uh, Iran, if Iran would tell me, well, there is a disparity, there is a security imbalance in the Middle East. Yes, there is a security imbalance in the Middle East. And I say that, you know, and I say it is not sustainable that you cannot continue to have Israel outside of, you know, of, of, the, of the system. The good news, at least, Israel is saying, we understand, we are ready to be part of the nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, but when we are ready to do that in the context of peace. And of course, when you get the kind of statements you, know, you got last week, you know, that's not going to play on confidence building in Israel to say, well, we are ready to give up our deterrence. You know? So we need to get everybody to understand that it takes two to tango. You know, the, the Arab world have to send a reassuring message to, to, to Israel not just Jordan, not just Egypt, by everybody. And Israel also has to understand that they cannot just stay outside of the game, that they have to, apply, they have, to have a system that is equitable. What, what I can do, and I can assure you that what I'm doing all the time, is to try to bridge the gap in perception, you know, the stereotyping between the two sides, to make sure that eventually we'll get a, a stable Middle East. It's, the Middle East right now is, is just a situation which is absolutely horrifying in many ways, you know, in, in many ways, you know, and I, 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 it pains me because I know how good the people are. I know how the culture could be, could be good there, but you have, you know, a mistrust, you have lack of good governance, you have a security imbalance, you have extremism, you, have, you name it, you know, and, and this is a region which has a lot of resources that have a lot of human resources, financial resources. It, it is, you know, I have, I share your pains, you know, but, and, but I can assure you that, as I said, I can do as much as I can, but I have, I'm a human, I'm fallible, I have a limited authority. But I, I'll use as much as I can to, to do it. Before. I apologize for the folks who had questions that didn't get a chance to ask them. Before we close, let me mention three things. First, uh, uh, for those of you who were particularly interested in this notion that the U.S. keeps uh, a large, the U.S. and Russia keep a large number of nuclear weapons on alert status, on hair trigger alert, that topic will be a major subject of discussion here in the forum Thursday night at 6 o'clock with Bill Perry the former Secretary of Defense. For those of you interested in the Olympics uh, and how Greece, I am. Created, how Greece uh, created a successful Olympics, the lady who did this, Gianna Angelopoulos, will be here in the forum tomorrow night. And for those of you who uh, can go eat quickly and then come back at 8 o'clock tonight, Bill White and his forum team have uh, Professor Murray on the Global Health Initiative, which relates pretty closely to some of the topics that Mohammed has raised before. But let me say be, on behalf of the locals here how honored we are to have Mohammed al here tonight and how proud we are that the Nobel uh, Prize has been awarded to him this year. Thank you. Thank you very much.